Welcome back to our tour of the AEC Mark II armored car as found in the Bastogne barracks. All right, so of course I am going to start as ever with the outside of the TC's hatch, which is a two-piece inwards folded thing with a little bit of nice cushioning. You're going to see to his front, firstly, he has his rotating periscope. He's got another one to the rear as well. Why not? The gunner has one to his front and in between the two, are or is a vein sight so as the commander is looking through his periscope if he wants to make sure that he can tell where the gunner is aiming more or less within his field of vision he's going to be using his vein sight you know traverse left traverse right steady on once the vein sight is more or less covering the target he can be fairly confident that the gunner can see it through his optic as well because that's the purpose of the thing uh, right, there's going to be a spotlight on the left, radio mount on the right, and while well, they've placed a Bren here, ordinarily it wouldn't be, be on the, uh, there's a mount on the right hand side, uh, but I'm not going to have them move it out of the way just for me. And the hatch is, I've seen better, I've seen worse. I mean, imagine, especially if you're wearing any of the TA-50 getting in and out of this, well, I say TA-50, of course, the British call the web gear or something entirely else, entirely different, um, things are going to snag. But no matter, uh, that is the outside of the turret, so let's hop in. So as you saw, in order to get down, I first had to push a button and kick the pedestal out of the way. So I can now get low enough that in theory I could then close the hatches. Uh, obviously I'm a little bit too tall for it, but that wouldn't have been so much of an issue in the 1940s. And once I'm down, though, I don't have a, a full down seat. There doesn't seem to be any accommodation for one. I asked the guy who restored us, is there, is there a commander's seat? And you know, stand. Okay. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, to his front, he has his periscope, which will rotate. And of course, his adjustable elevation. He's got another one over his shoulder. A nice feature they have in here is that they have retained the headset and talker. So, I mean, the headset obviously would wear, as you would imagine, uh, you can drop the talker so you not, don't have to hold it all the time. It just dangles on the cable. And then to speak, you get you got a, a large push the talk button. And you would actually bring bring your mouth all the way into the talker to speak into the funnel. It wasn't quite as good a microphone, perhaps, as you may have had. Plus, it, you also have the slight advantage. It might reduce some of the background noise, especially if you get a good seal. Well, not actually... I don't know if you've ever tried talking with a completely sealed item in front of you. It doesn't really work that way, but it probably will reduce at least some of the exterior sound or exterior noise. To his left, well, he's got a pistol port, the intercom system, which you'll see has Russian writing in this. And you'll see also on the wireless set behind him, there's a number 19, very common for British vehicles. And... It's in both English and Russian. So when they were building these things, when well, lend lease a lot of radios went to the Soviet Union. And so to make it simple, they simply put both languages on the data plates. So I'm learning things like flick in Russian is apparently flick. Uh, oh, this is, this is flicking a couple of places whenever it is. So tune, uh, what's that? Slavy? My Russian ain't great. Uh, but there you go, so you have that, and then you have uh, additionally pieces of stowage for whatever else that the TC might need to have here. I mean, I'm trying to imagine where you would even open a map in this thing. I mean, you, you want to have a small map board, is probably the best thing I'd say. And directly to his front, of course, is he's going to have the gunner. Uh, so outside of that, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the TC. So after having squeezed into the gunner's seat, I'm not sure what I did this, but it put an angled platform for my feet, uh, which is way too high for me. And I would have rather it wasn't there at all, I could just stretch out my legs. Now there is a lip around the bottom of the turret baskets, but yay high. And that stops my foot very adequately from slipping out and getting caught in anything as the turret is traversed. Traverse, well this is your Traverse motor. It is electric and it is controlled by a rather older type control handle. I mean, you saw something just like this in Matilda, for example. Pull in the um, pull in the handle in order to release it, 
and then depending on how far you traverse, the faster it will go. For elevation, well, there is the typical British shoulder mount. So gross elevation would be done with the shoulder, but once you have the, the right idea, you lock it in place, and there is a handle here, which provides you very steady, fine elevation. So it's a, a little bit more sophisticated than you would see on, let's say, the two pounder or even the Crusader. So you put your head up, you traverse with your left hand, and elevation with uh, the uh, right. Now the catch is that you need three hands because there is a pistol grip, which is kind of tied underneath here, so we'll inset this in a moment. Uh, you would hold this pistol grip somewhere you could easily grab it and quickly with one hand, either the elevation, probably the elevation uh, or the other, uh, you can let go of the one hand up and pull the trigger and fire the cannon before your target moved. Little inconvenient. Going left to right to his front, well, first you got a spanner. Uh, the optic is fairly simple by 1.8, give or take. Then you have the Besa machine gun, 7.92. Now, British, for some reason, decided to split their logistics. The Besa came in a 7.92, and that's what the Royal Armour Corps bought, because that's the way it came. Uh, the Besa was really designed to be a vehicle-mounted machine gun, worked very well in the role. The only problem was that the Royal Armoured Corps used a different caliber machine gun to the rest of the British Army. It didn't seem to bother them. They kept with it pretty much for the end of the war. And then you move to the right and you end up with the six pounder, 700 weight Mark three or five directly under the ventilator. Uh, before talking about the gun, so he has to mention he has his own rotating slide. We've got a ration pack here. It looks like signal flare, stowage, a turret lock on the left hand side, uh, extra ammunition for the six pounder or a 57 should you be an American, but this isn't an American vehicle, so it's a six pounder. Besides, they invented it, so they, they can call it whenever they like. And, right, then you talk about the gun. Now, the AEC Mark II, of course, was the six pounder equipped variant. The AEC Mark I had the one pounder, uh, two pounder, and the AEC Mark III had a 75. And I cannot imagine having a 75 millimeter in here. I have to assume it was a bit like Crusader and you had to get rid of a guy or a Valentine, get rid of a guy to put the 75 in. This is a plenty big enough gun. Now that said, of course, the six pounder was a very good weapon for its size. I had excellent anti-armor capability. Yeah, high explosive wasn't that of a 75, that's to be expected. But I mean, yes, this is a wheel tank, but it's not a tank, if you know, if you know what I mean. So the fact that this thing is equipped with a six pounder means that it's perfectly good for any reconnaissance and a support role, and that's indeed how it usually was used. And uh, it can provide good cover fire against any armor that was coming uh, to threaten your scouts. And uh, accurate, fast, uh, fast to fire, fast to lay. So there's nothing to complain about with the six pounder. Anyway, uh, let's hop next door now and have a quick look at the loader. Now, the loader is very definitely cramped because the guard for the six-pounder comes well into his space. Now, he is surrounded by ammunition, of course. There's about 60 rounds of six-pounder to be found here, of which there's a, a sort of a semi-ready bin of 16 rounds to his right, and there's three directly behind the gun. Now, there is actually ammunition scattered all over, so no matter where the turret is facing, you know, looking to my left, there's, oh, maybe about 10 to 12 rounds just by my feet, just from where the... Uh, gun is located. Uh, there's also about 3,200 rounds for the 792 Bisa, also scattered around. I'm looking at a rack behind there. Ammunition, well, you got, say, uh, AP, APC, BC, HE. Sabo did exist for the six pounder. It wouldn't surprise me one iota if the British decided not to give uh, the Sabo rounds to the armored cars because the British were kind of weird with their ammunition uh, expenditure. But your typical six pounder around would fly out at about 900 meters a second. And at closer ranges was actually more powerful in terms of benefiting capability than the 75 millimeter gun. But of course, the 75 millimeter was a better general purpose gun. And at longer ranges, things started to even out a little bit because of the mass of the 75 didn't slow down quite as fast as a six pounder. But still, in most cases and ranges, the six pounder actually technically had greater penetrating capability. This is a long story you can go back to about the, the Americans who were debating the six pounder for their tank destroyers, but uh, they decided that they wanted to fight at long range. 
But of course, in Western theater operations, your median range was somewhere around 450 meters. But I am digressing. To his front, he's got storage for the two inch smoke bombs. So the mortar would attach to the end of the tube here. Now, this is not a scout car for sneaking around in. You are going to get seen and you will want to escape as best as you can with your life. So that's why before they had many smoke grenade launchers, as you would find on a modern vehicle, you pop smoke, uh, literally you push a button, smoke all fires off in all the directions. You had your smoke bomb thrower, you'd aim your turret in more or less the direction of the opposition and lob a couple of smoke rounds. That would give you the concealment that you need to survive while you relocate and basically run away. Uh, to the rear, he is also in control of the electric. So you can see the, uh, the voltmeter here. The fuses are really old school. They're little cards that you plug in. And uh, if something goes wrong, you just pull it out and, and away you go. Power supply for the wireless. Again, the intercom system is uh, in Russian and English. Another pistol port to his right. And his... Uh, periscope to the front. There's also a couple of dome lights, by the way. There's one right up here. There's one just over here to help him see as he's working. And that about covers it. He has his hatch, which opens inwards from the front and back, as opposed to the two sides on the commander and gunner side. The hatch does not look any bigger. So, that done, uh, I will finally mention the stowage that's just above the wireless, and then we'll go into the driver's seat. Sadly, the driver's position is not one for me. I will not be a AEC driver for the instrument panel, such as it is, is annoyingly placed between my knee and the clutch pedal. So, I mean, I, no, I physically cannot drive it. Now, the seat will elevate and depress theoretically. It's kind of stuck in place. Uh, I'm not going to futz around with it too much. I would like to keep my fingers. Uh, there's only so much that I'm willing to risk for the sake of these videos. Uh, pedal arrangement, clutch, brake, accelerator, the brakes are air brakes. Uh, the steering wheel is horizontal and flat. Uh, it's not power steering on a 14 odd ton vehicle. You can imagine the problems which would uh, follow. That said, apparently once you, you drive about 40 kilometers in this thing, the whole system warms up nicely and it's very easy to drive with one hand and the other hand on the gear shift. The gear shift is on the left hand side. It's a four speed. In order to get into reverse, you need two hands. So you need one hand to hold up a uh, red lever that opens the gate and then the second hand to move the gear shift. A couple more handles on the right hand side. Big red handle is the uh, parking brake. It's the ratchet brake. Then further back to the right, you've got a transfer case for high range uh, uh, low gear. And on the uh, slightly to its left is a engage, disengage for four wheel drive. Otherwise, ordinarily, of course, on the roads, you just need two wheel drive. That's all you do. Uh, to see out above me, you can see he's got two periscopes, which I guess would be kind of angled outwards. There's not one in the middle facing forward. So once the periscopes are down and you latch them in place, once, once you have the, the top down, uh, you probably would rotate one forwards, one maybe to the side, and you'd drive a little bit offset. There's a couple of British vehicles that have this system. Uh, I think Centurion might have been one of them. It's a stupid system, but they did it anyway. Uh, wing mirrors, I can actually... This is the first time I sat in the driver's seat in a World War II vehicle, and I can actually see wing mirrors at work. And uh, because this thing will go along at a fair clip, I mean, it's in excess of 80 kilometers an hour, there is a good old-fashioned windshield that I can bring up and stop myself from eating the bugs. Another annoying thing is that they didn't wire up the intercom system completely. There is no way for the driver to speak to anybody else in the crew. He can hear, but he cannot speak back. So what he has is if he wishes to speak to the TC, there is a button here that says, call commander, um, which also of course is in Russian. He pushes a button and the TC will yell at him, I guess, or ask him well, what's wrong. Uh, there is no official way of dealing with it, apparently, but uh, a comic eventual will be, you know, one beep for yes, two beeps for no if you're answering a question, and three beeps for something, something else, stop, get out, talk to me, I need to get out, what have you. To its rear are the electrics, so the master power is down underneath this big black box, which is four trip switches. The starter motor is on the right-hand side, so you preheat and then you, you push the start. Uh, diesel engines, uh, uh, sorry, engines, singular. About 170 horsepower, if I recall correctly. The, the thing ran well. 
uh, whatever the flaws of the vehicle, the, the, the drivetrain probably wasn't one of them. Although I have to say I am not convinced by the location of the gear shift. Over the left-hand side, again, a typical British thing. And understandable, especially considering the, the origin of this vehicle was actually Desert Warfare. And they ended up seeing a few uh, bits of service in Italy. Is uh, a large drinking water container with a little tap at the bottom. So you can put your cup down underneath and fill up your cup uh, with drinking water and pass it back to your crew behind you. Finally, on the right-hand side, big lever here for the uh, for the hatches. I am i don't think I'm going to play with this. I would like to keep my head intact. Uh, again, there, there's limits to how far I will go. So that done. Uh, see a little bit of stowage above the pedals. And it's time to get out. Now, if you're curious as to what the diesel sounds like, what the vehicle looks like moving, we can arrange that. After the first 120 or so Mark 1s were built, production changed to the Mark 2. They built a better part of 300 of those, and then another, give or take, 200 of the Mark 3 with a 75mm gun. Now, yeah, nitpickers will quibble with the figures, but they're a reasonable approximation. In terms of service, to its credit, the vehicle did its job fairly well. Uh, so it was often used as a heavy troop in the reconnaissance unit, so it would support the lighter vehicles. Now, lighter could be a relative term, when you're talking vehicles like the Staghound, but the Staghound only had a 37mm pop gun, whereas you have a 6 pounder or a 75 on the AEC. So it was doing the job it was designed for. It was quick, it had a tank sized cannon, it could support other vehicles, and by reputation, the thing was absolutely bulletproof. Uh, mechanics are going, oh yeah, we saw these vehicles and this vehicle and this vehicle in the mechanics workshops, and we never seem to see an AEC for some reason. I guess if your history is designing commercial vehicles, which are designed to run eight hour, eight to ten hours a day, seven days a week, around the streets of London, you are going to build a reliable vehicle, and that, that's exactly what AEC ended up doing. The location of service a little bit in North Africa, they saw most of the service with 10th Indian, for example, in Italy. Uh, since I'm in Belgium, I might as well mention that the Belgians got about 66 of these Mark IIs and another half dozen of the Mark III. Now, in British service, they left in 1958 to hung around a little longer, of course, in other countries. That's uh, pretty much it for the AEC. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the War Heritage Institute and Bastogne Barracks for letting us crawl around their vehicle. And I hope you found the video interesting and informative. Even if it is a little ugly. <laughs> Right, sadly the driver's position is not one for me. I cannot drive it because the speedometer panel is in the way of my leg. <laughs>